you're going to see me on a campaign, a continuous campaign, uh, to keep art in schools, particularly in America, because it may very well be an artist that creates the clean energy idea of this century. Um, you know, what kind of citizens are we going to develop if we take art and music and dance, you know, out of our schools? It's ridiculous. Uh, the greatest investment we can make is to ensure that the kids get everything they need to become, you know, well-rounded, good good students, good citizens uh, for the planet, good thinkers. We're competing with the entire world, okay? We have to keep art as one of the key components in our schools, in our curriculum. You know, quite a journey now over 30 years on the green message and kind of uh, living the dream of being an artist in California. You know, when I grew up in Michigan, far away from the ocean, you know, I always felt that one day I would be in California with my art because obviously, look at my art, right, it's right. more West Coast style. But um, I got a great education. I went to a great art school. I only went two years because, uh, you know, I couldn't take the winters in Michigan. But I uh, came to Laguna Beach here um, when I was 14. You know, we did a little road trip out here uh, with the family. And uh, this is the very first place I came, which is Main Beach. And, uh, you know, I immersed myself in the ocean. And when I came up out of the water for the first time, two gray whales actually uh, broke the surface, spouted and fluked up right in front of me, pretty much changing my life forever. You know, I was an artist. How old were you at that time? Well, I was 14 years old, and, um, you know, art is really, you know, the only thing I ever wanted to do. But uh, I was inspired by uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau. And uh, every Sunday he would have the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, and, uh, you know, he instilled in me a passion for the ocean and uh, the water planet. So, you know, those, those memories are very strong and vivid, and. Uh, you know, eventually I became a diver and I started uh, diving into the oceans and taking the beauty that I see and sharing it forward through my art, my paintings, sculptures, and eventually through uh, the giant murals, the Whaling Wall Project. Well, I mean, um, what do you think most people perceive you to be when they hear of Weiland and the artist? Painter, Rich. sculptor? No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't always like that, though. I was a starving artist, okay? And I'm still not rich. I'm rich in a great life. I mean, I... Yeah, you know, the most uninteresting thing to me is money. I mean, seriously, the most interesting thing is being creative, to get out of bed and feel great passion for what you love to do. I like to create things out of nothing, you know, whether it's a blank canvas, an ugly building, um, a piece of clay, turn that into a beautiful octopus or a big sculpture of a dolphin or a whale or a shark. Um, you know, I, I'm an artist first and foremost, and uh, that's, that's pretty much... Um, you know, been my entire life and lifestyle, and then to be able to share, you know, that gift with friends, with family, with over, you know, 400,000 collectors now in 100 countries wow. is, is a wonderful thing. But it, it, it didn't start out that way. I was a classic starving ar artist. Uh, when I came out here, I was living on Snickers bars, you know, but I would cut them in threes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and people don't believe that, but it's true. You really did that? Oh, absolutely. I lived in a little tiny studio in Huntington Beach, and uh, I think it was $100 a month, and, um, and, and even that was tough. Right. But ironically, I feel like I was an artist that was in the right place at the right time, and when the environmental movement started in the 70s, uh, there I was, and, uh, you know, inspired by Jacques Cousteau and Greenpeace, and and that whole green movement was just in its early stages. And here I was, an artist, taking all that inspiration in. And I decided early on that art could play an important role uh, in conservation and uh, clean water, healthy oceans, that art could move people to a higher consciousness and even um, action. Well, so I've been involved in that green movement for 30 years now. You've, you've got the whaling walls, which uh, are viewed, I guess, by over a billion people every year. Uh, you've done now over 100 of them. What? Yeah, you know, after I did the first one, which, by the way, is on the side of this building, they were going to tear my original whaling wall down, so I bought the building here. I bought the whole block so they couldn't do it. So, oh, that's and so four inches of it was on their property on the Hotel Laguna, uh -huh. so they painted over it. Wow. But the city allowed me to do a tile mural, uh, in, you know, a replica of the original wall. But, yeah, unfortunately, we lost my first whaling wall, and it's really sad. But after I did that first one, I decided if I was serious about using public art to raise awareness and uh, inspire people to get involved, I, I would have to probably paint 100 walls. So uh, when I was doing an interview like this mm -hmm. uh, for the LA Times, uh, Gordon Grant, uh, the writer, said, 
how many of these, you know, giant murals of whales are you going to paint? I go, I'm going to paint a hundred. And uh, I painted a hundred. It took me 27 years to do it. And last year, I'm proud to say I painted the last one in Beijing for the Green Olympics as an official uh, cultural Olympic event for the Green Olympics and uh, invited kids from all the Olympic countries to join me in painting my last uh, whaling wall project, which we painted on canvas. Now, is it your last one or are you going to do more or that's it? That's the last whaling wall. Okay. Will I quit painting murals? No. But what I'm really focused on now is uh, creating a hundred sculptures, monumental sculptures, life-size and in some cases larger than life sculptures of all the great whale species and other aquatic life and uh, pick 100 host cities. 100 cities will have one of my sculptures and so it'll be a global uh, uh, environmental sculpture uh, tour. So the largest art project in history. So wow. first one was the Whaling Wall project. Now, you know, job security, but I think it's fun. And if you look around the gallery, you'll see some of my sculptures. So just imagine them, you know, the size and scale of, say, uh, the bird's nest or, you know, in Beijing or um, the cube. When I was in Beijing, I was absolutely inspired by some of the architecture that was created for the Olympics and some of the uh, other great things that are going on. So uh, my project really is going to be a 25-year project to create the largest uh, environmental and uh, monumental art project in history. So yeah. now I like to think big, you know. Um, it doesn't cost any more to think as big as you possibly can, and there's not enough people today that think really big. That's an, that's an interesting statement. So. you got to think big, man. you got to think, go big. It, it, it takes the same amount of energy to think big or think small, so it's up to you. I always felt that uh, bigger is better. Obviously, my subjects are big. Yeah. Well, what, what, do, you, do you believe your skill was, uh, your, it's a gift, you're born with it, or was it developed? I mean, maybe, it, of course, it's both. But, I mean, in your, your perspective, <clears throat> have you really worked hard to develop this, or have you just really, you had this gift in your well, life? Well, it's both. For, first of all, it, it's a gift. You're either a pure artist or, or you're not. But you can learn to paint. You can learn to be a good artist. To be a great artist, I personally believe it's a gift, and uh, when you have the gift, uh, some people don't even appreciate or use that. Yeah. So I always uh, appreciated the gift I was given. But I've been painting since I was four years old. I used to paint dinosaurs, Jurassic scenes, and um, nobody ever told me to stop. So I just kept going. Kids sometimes are discouraged. They're going, ah, you're not a very good artist. But you know, I never was discouraged. I always had a tremendous amount of confidence. Right, right. And I, I did have a lot of support. I mean, I had an art teacher in first grade saw me kind of not paying attention in class and uh, sketching, and she told me to stay after class, and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble here. But she, uh, she said, your drawings are very good, and she was an artist herself, so we drew together for about an hour, and afterwards she said, Wyland, you could be a great artist. I was in first grade. I believe the teacher, and now whenever I have a chance, I'll come off a wailing wall, painting a mural, and I'll see a group of kids, or even one kid, and I'll s sketch with them, look at their drawings, and uh, encourage them. So that totally resonates with you when you see kids and you just want to encourage well, them? Well, I it think it really told me how powerful that is for you to mentor a young person and uh, try, try to give them something. I call it sharing it forward, you know? Yeah. Um, I've had my 15 minutes of fame. You know, I've been very successful. And now I feel a great responsibility to share what I know uh, with kids. Um, not only the art, but the message. But the art is critical as well because you're going to see me on a campaign, a continuous campaign, uh, to keep art in schools, particularly in America, because it may very well be an artist that creates the clean energy idea of this century. Um, you know, what kind of citizens are we going to develop if we take art and music and dance, you know, out of our schools? It's ridiculous. Uh, the greatest investment we can make is to ensure that the kids get everything they need to become, you know, well-rounded, good, good students, good citizens uh, for the planet, good thinkers. I mean, we're competing with the entire world. Okay, we have to keep art as one of the key components in our schools and our curriculum. So you're going to see me fighting to keep art and science, and in fact, my ultimate goal is to bridge those two worlds. In nature, art and science come together.
beautifully. Well, you're, you know, you're more than just an artist from my perspective. I mean, you're, you're a very incredible entrepreneur, and I'd love to hear your definition of what your thoughts are. Well, I are. had to be. I had to be an entrepreneur, and I had to build a brand. I didn't even know it was called a brand, mm -hmm. but I knew uh, instinctively that uh, people were not going to do it for you. You basically, you know, I would sell my art to galleries, and they would sell them on, and I'd go back, and uh, they'd say, well, we had a lot of bills, so the artist doesn't get paid, and I said, well, Maybe I should open a gallery. So 31 years ago, I opened the first little studio gallery out in the canyon. And uh, it really taught me how to not only uh, present my art, frame it, market it, but also how to talk to people about my art. And the very first collectors that I've had um, still collect my art today. It was a lot cheaper back then. But I decided right then and there that uh, you had to be more than an artist. You know, the idea of the bohemian starving artist, it didn't look like much fun. I mean, look at Van Gogh, a guy lost a piece of his ear. Yeah. And I thought, you know what, I'm not that kind of personality. I love people, and I love taking my art and seeing it move people. So, uh, you know, all those elements kind of came together in a great way, but I realized that I had to um, communicate with people and, uh, you know, um, basically just build my own brand from scratch. There was nothing like it. You know, the art that I create is a new art form. You know, the art of the past was marine art, which really is man's conquest of the sea. Mine is man's appreciation of the sea and what we need to protect. It's called, I call it marine life art. And it's really captured the imagination of the entire world. It's global now. And I'm really excited about that. So with that success, uh, it's really allowed me to do more with my nonprofit. So those things go hand in hand. There's a real balance going on here. There's two great things happening. But it's a new paradigm for artists. It's the greatest time in history to be an artist because why? People are interested in art. And apparently art is a better investment than the stock market. Woo, Def there you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, All right, we got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, art is cool, it's hip. So be a collector, if you're watching this, Go buy a piece of art. Well, do, do you have a distinction between good art and bad art? I mean, how would you define art? When you say I art do. needs to stay in school, what does art mean? Art. Art is what is inside of you and how you perceive the world. And in my case, it's the natural world. Um, you know, I'm an appreciator of a lot of different styles of art. In fact, I never used to like, you know, the abstract stuff. I would go to, like, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, and I'd go, that's crap. You know, you've done it. You walk in there, it looks like the guy spilled paint on the, on the ground, you know? Right. And uh, it's Jackson Pollock. And I'm going, I don't get that. But after you kind of live a little longer, you kind of, and you go back and you look at it again, you go, that's pretty good. That's got some rhythm and there's some color theory. And so, you know, your art evolves, you know? In the beginning, uh, you know, your tastes are a certain way. And then as you kind of travel around the world like I was just in Beijing and, mm -hmm. and the art scene there is emerging and really dynamic and, and, and it inspired me in fact so much so that uh, the official artist for China uh, for, for the Olympics uh, and I uh, really painted together for two weeks and uh, I was the official US Olympic artist so we got to paint you know his style of a traditional Chinese brush and of course mine isn't perfect but he thought it was pretty good and now I'm like possessed with it so as I travel as I take in other art forms and then I kind of you know spit it out there you know the Wyland way um, it's exciting it keeps it exciting keeps it fresh and um, I know one thing for sure people walk into a Wyland galleries and go yeah how could one guy create all this art well I'll tell you how I don't have a job and by the way I don't want one either this is all I do I get up every day and I create art it's a good gig would you, could you ever see yourself not doing it? No, no, it'd be impossible not to do this. In well, fact, the reason I'm doing the Jackson Pollock and the abstracts, not only because I think it's a great challenge and fun, is when, when my hands start shaking, I can still do abstracts. In fact, they'll probably even be better. So wow. anyway, I'm kind of predicting and I'm getting a little looser. So that's what artists do. I mean, they start out tight and then you just don't care. You're like, hey, I'm having fun here. So. And then you probably go back and get tight again. So anyway, it, it really is uh, probably the ultimate career on the planet is being an artist. I mean, what is an artist? I mean, really. And you get away with a lot more. Like, I work with a lot of great <laughs> scientists, right? They have to follow rules. Artists? There are so no much. rules. There's no rules in being an artist. And, and the business side of art. 
it's wide open. But the one thing you got to have is you got to have work ethic, and you, you you have to have integrity. You have to be honest, and that's that's what owning a, a gallery uh, has enabled me to do is to promote my art the right way, to frame it, to sell it, to get to know the customers and collectors, and uh, do it on my terms. And uh, not too many artists have that, that opportunity. That's what success gives you, the opportunity to do it your way, as Frank said. Well, so you, you have um, the side of you that's the artist that creates, and you have this business side of you that actually monetizes the art. Right. What's the difference between Wyland the artist, Wyland the businessman? Well, I'm kind of a hybrid. You're either a, the artist, you know, like in the corner, you know, kind of timid, or uh -huh. not me, I'm not timid. I'm kind of Mark Victor Hansen style. I'm out there... In so you're like ADD, face. like Mark? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So I, I have a lot of different, um, like Kobe Bryant, I have a lot of different ways of getting, getting to the hoop. Right. Which getting to the hoop to me is, is uh, getting my art into collections, um, talking to people about the art, but, but equally important, the message of the art. The message that uh, in this century uh, we need an environmental renaissance. We, we need a sea change you know, in the way that we've been treating our, our planet. So um, I'm sure when I started out, everybody went, wow, he's painting whales? The guy's going to starve to death, you know? But that didn't matter to me. What I felt that my subject matter meant something to my soul. And I felt that if the whales couldn't have a voice, I would be the voice for them through my art. And uh, darn if it didn't resonate, not only in Southern California, but now globally. That message is, is now global and uh, it's, it's not going away. There's an environmental renaissance happening right now and it's uh, no longer just a little trend. I mean it's, it's, uh, it's in corporations, it's, it's uh, in families and kids and I'm sitting, I'm positioned to actually make a difference, to really do some high-level things. Take a look at the natural world. Get out of the computer for a couple of minutes and go outside and realize what we have and, and how important it is to protect it, not only for us, uh, not only for the whales, but for our kids, for future generations. You know, one thing I want to make a distinction of, because a lot of people, you know, be it musicians, be it artists, whatever, they think when someone starts making money that they've sold out. Yeah. And what it appears is that in the process of you making money, you've been able to accomplish incredible things that not having that money, you, you would have never been able to accomplish. So have you yeah. gotten better as a result of becoming financially successful? Are you about the same? I mean, what's your perspective well, on that? Well, I, I just think that being successful gives you a lot more opportunities. Like, I had the opportunity to headline the largest uh, international art show in the world, the International Art Expo in New York at mm -hmm. Jacob Javits. They asked me to headline this year and try to inspire artists to think green, to go green, to use green materials, uh, you know, water-based paints instead of oils, uh, printing materials. I'm now printing on bamboo, which is very sustainable. So what I do is I'm educating myself, and then I'm sharing it forward with artists and with people around the world. I also am asked continuously to talk to art students when I lecture or wh whether I give a commencement speech about the business of art. Now, it was really taboo. When I went to college, they said, Wyland, you're a fine artist. Don't worry about the business. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make one bit of sense. I mean, if you don't want to do the business, that's fine. Hire, you know, a business manager, whatever. But at least understand all aspects of the job, the career of being an artist in the 21st century. In fact, Mark Victor Hansen, who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, and I uh, just wrote a book called Don't Be a Starving Artist. And oh, we want great. to give it to all the artists for free. So hopefully at some point you'll be able to download it. If, if not, you know, I want to help artists be successful because I want artists to be happy. You know, um... They should be happy. You should be happy that you were blessed with some talent, uh, that, that you can, you know, create something out of nothing. I mean, being an artist is uh, it's a wonderful thing. Well, um, you are arguably one of the greatest marketers of art alive today. I don't know if you consider yourself that, but definitely. I've heard that. Yeah. I've well, heard that. I mean, I've got some marketing skills because, uh, you know, I basically just learned as I went. I said, well, this works and this doesn't work. What, what is marketing art from your perspective? I mean, what, do you consider yourself a marketer? Do you think not of really? Like you know, sales and marketing, uh, not really. I am of the belief that if you create a great product, that people will come. But that may not be enough. You may have to, 
uh, do more. You may have to market it. So, you know, I think marketing alone and sales alone is not enough, and especially during, uh, you know, during a recession like this. If you look, half the galleries probably closed in the U.S. right now and around the world. Um, half the artists are having to get real jobs. Um, the strong brands, uh, cause-related brands like you know the Wyland brand, are, are there. They will be there. They will weather the storm because we spent 30 years doing good things. Not only creating the art, but forwarding the message of conservation and then also giving back. You know, the charity part. You know, we donate to over 100 conservation groups a year and individuals. We give Wyland scholarships to kids. Uh, I've personally painted with over a million kids in the last 30 years, and that to me is my highest accomplishments. Uh, being able to, my team and I, um, set up canvases at, at science museums in schools, actually visit schools in all 50 states in America and, and paint with kids and, and let them know that it's, it's great to be an artist. Follow your dream. Gotcha. Well, what, what strengths and qualities uh, do you think are just absolutely essential for someone to be successful as an artist? The biggest one, you're going to think this is ridiculous. Be a nice person. Every time I talk to kids, I go, be genuine, be a nice person, mm -hmm. be nice to your parents, be nice to your teachers, be nice. I've tried to be nice to people for 30 years, and these people remember. They go, you, you were nice to me when you were a starving artist at the art festival here in Laguna, and I remember that. And I told you I didn't have any money, but one day I'm going to come and buy one of your sculptures, your tables, and, and people remember that. So I always say, you know, be nice and, uh, you know, give something back, you know. When I moved to Hawaii, that was the big thing, that the Hawaiians always seem to talk about giving something back. And, and in, in the giving, it really comes back at you, as you know. It's the law of karma. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video, and I want to let you know that I have a new book that's come out, and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description, or you can wait till the end of this video, or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com, and you can get a copy there. If you, if you had to give someone like pieces of advice on just starting out, they're starving artists, they admire you, they look up to you, I mean, what, what would you tell them? Obviously, be nice, it does sound simple, be but it's, nice it's huge. Be nice is real simple, um, and, and follow your dream, never ever give up. If you're doing what you love to do in life, whether you want to be an artist, a scientist, a writer, a filmmaker, um, you've reached the pinnacle of success, because if that's your dream, I want to be a writer, an artist, um, a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, a great honorable career by the way in fact I think they should pay the lawyers what they pay to teachers and pay to teachers what they pay lawyers oh that would be then you awesome. get rid of 90 percent of the lawyers and you have great well-paid teachers that would be fantastic that's my philosophy <laughs> but anyway I just think if if you want to do something and it's burning inside you America you know you're born in the greatest country in the world because it allows you that that freedom and that opportunity to do that of course they want to tax the holy heck out of you Hey, pay your taxes, just make more money, give more, and it all seems to work out in the end. But if you're loving what you're doing, um, you've reached the pinnacle of success in, in life. That's what life is. And for me to tell these kids and these college kids that are all worried to coming out of college in a recession, I say, look, you're already ahead of me. I didn't graduate. I only went two years. I got an honorary doctorate's degree, three of them. But um, hey, you guys are ahead of me. All you got to do is work hard and, and just keep following your goal. Well, uh, one name, Wyland. I mean, what is this with artists with one name? Well, I always liked uh, my family name. Uh -huh. So even, in, even in, in high school, on my jock jacket, it said Wyland. So I always liked Wyland. And uh, I always like to take negative things and make them positive. So where I'm from, calling you by your last name was derogatory, but I liked it. I wanted to make my name a name of respect. So anyway, you got Sting and you got... Uh, you know, Cher and all the and Madonna and, and uh, Barney, uh, you know, yeah. one of the greatest. And the artist formerly known as whatever he is. Yeah, no, just Wyland is good. Less is more. Does that help you meet women? Just the one name? Oh, is right. it better? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, when I was in, uh, in, in France, you know, the, the artist cannot understand why I, you know, would paint whales because the biggest thing in the world is artists. You get to paint beautiful models and, you know, wonderful looking women and I go yeah I do paint women but they're 40 tons and they live out there in the ocean 
So anyway, they laughed at that. They thought it was fun. But, you know, I'm, what, 52 now. So uh -huh. that's young for an artist. Right now I'm doing my 21st book of my art. And, you know, most artists that have a book are dead. I didn't like that. That whole starving artist, bohemian, you know, no success, you got to suffer for your art. That whole thing stinks. So I think in the 21st century, we need to do a 180, you know, paradigm shift. And, and I'm willing to take the bullets w with these art critics. You know, they haven't really harassed me in a long time, but they say, eh, well, it's commercial. Right now, I think they think I'm pretty good. And this is all good. Who cares? If you paint for the critics, that's the biggest mistake you're going to have. Paint for you. Paint for your soul. Fill yourself up. And uh, if it sells, geez, that's good. You know, I think they always got it backwards. They said, oh, I'm a fine artist. Never sold a painting in your whole life. Right. People hate it. It's junk. But the art critics love this stuff. Oh, he's a fine artist. He's living in some shack down there. And, you know, <laughs> um, no. That's ridiculous. I think a fine artist is some, an artist that people love, appreciate, and, and collect. That's a fine artist. Who, who wrote the book on this fine art thing? I don't get it. Right. The commercial, uh, you know, you're commercial because you sold some art. You know, they always said that uh, Norman Rockwell was commercial and now Leroy Neiman and Peter Max. And all. These guys are fine artists, uh, Robert Bateman. You know, well, um, there are also people that influenced the world tremendously and have built a, a huge uh, base. Of absolutely. They've been very successful. Um, but I think most artists don't really achieve any success till they're dead. Yeah. And that's dumb. You should actually uh, get all the success when you're like in, in elementary school. Yeah. And you know the perks now. I mean, now they want to give you everything when you're an established artist. I think they should give it to you when you're a starving Perfect. artist. See, it's, the whole thing's backwards because... Yeah. Now you really don't need anything. Your career is kind of taken off. And um, I, I just, I, I love the idea that I can make a difference uh, in, in, in people's lives, particularly young people. And, and that, that to me is the value of, of, of my life. That, um, that is so fulfilling to know that I can um, go anywhere in the world, take out a paintbrush and stretch a canvas and, and bring kids from all over the country to come together and paint a vision of whatever the theme is. Yeah. Uh, the one we're doing now uh, is with the National Forestry and, and, and uh, NOAA. So uh, those two organizations, because of the Wyland Foundation, are working together. It's the forest to the sea. And uh, we're going to paint that vision with schools all over the nation. We're going to kick it off on, on Thursday. Um, you know, in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall. Anyway, it's exciting. Um, I guess at the end of the day, if you're just doing it for the money, I don't, I don't think that's, that's what it's about. But the money's okay. I'm going to tell you well, this. Well, you're, you're a capitalist. Oh, you absolutely. This is America. And, you know, um, it's okay to be successful and make money and drive, drive nice cars. I do. I drive good motorcycles. And uh, I think it's the American way. And I, I, I'm a big-time capitalist. I think the more successful you are, the more you can give it back. By the end, uh, we're going to give it all back anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I have a good friend named Dan Sullivan that uh, founded this company called Strategic Coach, and he said, you know, he says the uh, the only problem with capitalism it was named by its enemies, and that capitalism in its purest form is this collaboration between mm, other people. And yeah. you talked about integrity, you talked sure. about creating value, sure. getting paid for it. I mean, that there'd be no innovations, there'd be no improvements in anything if it wasn't for people like that. And so, in the art world, I think you have a massive amount of influence. So, yeah. for for artists that are that are out there and they're they're struggling and, and they're they're challenged. I mean, so many of them that I meet, they have this aversion mm -hmm. to making money. Right. And I mean, how do you how do you shift that? I mean, what could you say to them? Because really, you, you're in a position to really influence that type of thing. Well, I think being a good artist is not enough. I think you've got to be a good human being. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think today. Also, I think uh, you got to have a cause element. Just because you're a great artist, you can't be a great artist and, and a complete. You know what? Right. You can, Jackass or whatever. Yeah, and I've seen it. You know, the, the worst enemy, you know, is the artist himself. If, if you're not really, you know, communicating and, and being a, you know, I guess a good individual. I mean, I really think that that's been something that has got me through the peaks and valleys of the recessions. I've seen these before. You know, it's, uh, and then it always seems the harder you work, the, 
the more good things happen to you. Right. You know, I called Spencer Johnson, who wrote uh, Who Moved My Cheese, he just yeah. wrote Peaks and Valleys, the new book, one of the most successful authors of all times. And I said, did you read this book, uh, The Secret? Because I thought it was amazing. And yeah. he goes, Wyland, come on. He goes, you and I have been living the secret for 25, 30 years. We put great things out in the universe and we, we kind of will them to happen. And sure enough, that's what comes back to you. So always put out good vibes, put out big dreams, think big, and set, set your goals and go after it. And, and those things come. And it's, it's really ironic because even in the beginning when I was you know, having trouble paying a rent or whatever, uh, sure enough, at the last second when something was due, car payment, whatever, somebody would commission a painting or a mural so, so you just you just you, you consider deal. yourself a lucky guy or I'm lucky and uh, I work really hard at my luck mm -hmm. and you know I have a lot of people that that work for me and I take care of my family a lot too they take care of me so we have this symbiotic relationship so um, but they realize that you know I'm out there in front and they're like cheering me on just keep going with it you know because I've created this tidal wave of uh, of art but. Uh, tidal wave of goodwill. And as you're creating good things in the universe, other good things are coming to you. So anyway, if you're creating bad things, I'm sure you're just going to get avalanched, you know? You're going you're gonna to fall off the, the lip and, uh, you know, hit the reef. Well, well you're, 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 you're a totally prolific guy. I mean, obviously, books, art, photography, everything you do, the, 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 the wailing walls. Um, how many pieces of art do you even know that you've created? Well, mine's like a batting average. <laughs> I'm kind of like consider it a batting average. I try to do like my average around 350, 400 originals, major pieces of art a year. Wow. You know, but think about it. I really don't do anything else. Although the foundation, the Wyland Foundation takes about half of my time. But it's, it's the balance of, I think it's a balance. I think if you just stayed in the studio and created art all day, you might go a little crazy. So the, the balance is to, to have something else to do, which is, create wonderful art, and then go out and share it and how, get, get kids involved. How do you manage your time between all this? Well, what I try to do is not manage it. I try not to manage my time. I like to be kind of free-flowing and go with the flow, okay? Like today, we were going to go on the Goodyear blimp, right. okay? And unfortunately, the wind was blowing. But I had just painted the largest earth portrait uh, in history, a giant three-story mural portrait of, of the planet Earth on top of the largest mural in history in Long Beach that I painted 17 years ago. So uh, I had seen uh, the finished mural, of course, that I painted on Earth Day on CNN, but I was gonna get a chance today to go up and see it from the blimp and photograph it. And uh, so that didn't happen, and that's why we're here doing this interview. But anyway, what the heck was my point there? My point was, um, for Earth Day, uh, I wanted to do something really, um, artsy and kind of cool and hip. So I decided that in a 24-hour marathon, I would paint a portrait of the planet Earth in deep black space. And uh, I did. It, was, it looked impossible. When I got up on the roof, I couldn't see one end to the other. It was so big. But anyway, the way that it turned out, uh, it was awesome. And there was, at one point on Earth Day, there was 11 helicopters kind of, you know, swarming around. It looked like a pop apocalypse now, you know, right. shooting this, and then it was going around the world, the idea that an artist could paint the largest earth. You know, the only thing larger was the earth itself. But we painted <laughs> this thing, a, a volunteer effort, in 24 hours, and um, required, I don't know, 4,000 gallons of paint. Man. Well, yeah. Okay, so th that's, that's fascinating to me. So, do you see it, the finished product, uh, in your mind, or do you create it as you go along? Well, the funny thing is, I've never really done one like that. So what I did is, here I am, if you can imagine, I'm standing on top of the earth, and we have footage of this, so, so I'm standing there. Just in case someone wants a question that this is Absolutely. Really so I'm standing there, and I have to imagine, in my mind, the earth that I'm about to paint on this roof from space. I'm not looking at any pictures, nothing. So what I do is I imagine North America, South America, and then, of course, the enormous water planet, all the blue. And um, I just painted the entire thing from my mind's eye. And then I started to second guess, well, you know, is, is this going to be right? Are there the Great Lakes here? Or, you know, is Alaska up there? Or, uh, but when I watched CNN that night, it was the first time I got to see it from, you know, above. And uh, 
It was perfect. Absolutely perfect. So trust your instincts. Do you, do you ever, I mean, do you ever find yourself saying, I screwed this up, or I'm going to scrap this, I made a mistake? Well, I mean, the thing is, if it was my, you know, wall or roof, then, then I probably would have did grids and really took my time. I mean, 24, but it's not mine, so what do I care? I go in very <laughs> loose. You know, that's the thing with these walls, too. I always say, you know. But they I, come out so awesome. Oh, yeah, I mean, it well, seems like you don't screw up. Well, yeah, not that you can see. <laughs> I always say I practice on other people's walls. Right. Yeah. But I, you know, I know this is a kind of a business and entrepreneur thing and uh, you really, you know, art and business really don't go together, but they should. Because the whole world is art. I mean, look at cities uh, around the world are basically judged on the art that they have, right? Uh -huh. Only in America is art kind of a second-class citizen. Try to get a loan as an artist. Forget it. I always tell them I'm a publisher, which is true, too. But uh, the art thing needs to, uh, to come up. And uh, I'm going to really be working hard with my you know, professional artist friends and, and uh, people in the industry to, to bring art into the schools and, and bring up the appreciation of art in America. Because it is appreciated. If you go anywhere else in the world, you know, artists are worshipped. Well, you're, 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 you're doing a lot of things to influence and help a lot of people. So as it relates to business people, I mean, what sort of things would you recommend that they learn? I mean, did you just develop these business skills or did you have mentors? I mean, what, did you, what do you do well, to educate yourself? Yeah, well, I just developed my own strategy on, on uh, you know, selling and marketing my art. And then I started out having one little studio gallery, and then eventually we opened probably 30, 30 or so you know, galleries around the country in strategic places. And now what I've done is I've decided that I want to pass uh, ownership on to the managers and friends so they could open Wyland Galleries. You know, because it is a good gig. It's a great lifestyle. They have art that you love and then be able to sell it right. to your friends and family and, and collectors. I mean, it, it's a great business. So. Uh, right now, I'm looking globally at taking my brand into China, so Wyland China, and sell it kind of like Coca-Cola. License it? Or? Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm into licensing big time. Can you talk just even a couple minutes on licensing? Sure, branding and licensing, uh, they go hand in hand. But licensing, I mean, you know, I thought I was doing really good in licensing, you know. And then I heard that SpongeBob did $1.4 uh, $1 billion last year, $1.4 billion. I went, whoa, a SpongeBob, and then Disney did 265 billion. Right. Okay, now that's some serious license. So did that okay. annoy you, or just inspire? No, you? no. And, and this is the <laughs> thing: if you're an artist, don't get mad. Get even. No, if, if an artist does good, kiss the ground he walks on and go, "Thank God, that means it's possible." Uh -huh. I mean, I've sold originals for over 200 thousand for uh -huh. a living artist. <laughs> impossible. Um, I've sold a watercolor here for $97,000, a watercolor for a living artist. I don't know any living artist that ever did that in history. So it's if an good. artist, do, don't be a hater. Be a lover. Go, my God, a living artist sold a painting for that much money. Cool. That means it's possible, right? Yes. So how does someone learn how to do that if they don't know? I mean, here you are doing it. You're doing it. But if you, you know. I don't think you... it happens overnight. I think no, what, what's not. happened is I've developed a, a, a really good following. And uh, people have been following my career for 30 years now. And uh, a lot of people realize that art is a good, good way to go. It's a good investment. I don't sell it as an investment. I sell it as an investment into your life. Art enriches your life. People that have my art, they're not buying it saying, oh, God, when he kicks off, you know, this stuff's going to be worth a fortune. No, they, they love the art, and that's, that's how I try to present it. So, so what do you collect? What are you into? I mean, well, I don't even have to anymore. I could trade with anybody. <laughs> I mean, geez, you know, virtually anybody in the world will trade with me. But I, uh, I have a Robert Wood, and it's really ironic because when I was a kid growing up in Michigan, my mom had this cheap Kmart painting. Remember those kind you buy at Kmart over the couch? And they've got the frame on it, same thing. Robert Wood, the seascape artist from Laguna. So I'm growing up in Michigan. Here's the painting. Well, about 15 years ago, I'm walking down the street here in Laguna where I live. And I go into a gallery and I look, and there's that painting, but it's the original. Oh, wow. So I went, oh. So you got it. Oh, yeah, of course. So, so now I hang that in my house in Florida. And, and I love telling people that story. When I was a kid, my mom paid $15 for that painting. Uh, I paid more. 
I would imagine. Uh, Robert Wood's dead. He's not making anymore. Mm -hmm. But he was one of the great uh, seascape painters. Also, Robert Wood uh, did how to paint seascapes with Walter Foster books. Well, they're now doing Wyland books, how to paint marine life. It's amazing how things come full circle. And if you're watching this, your turn's next. Yeah, well, you know, and it goes to, to, with what you said about being nice to people, because it's like one of my favorite quotes. I don't even know who originated is, be yeah. nice to the people you meet on the way up, because they're going to be You may the see same. them on the way down. Yeah, so, exactly. That's so certainly true. And you've seen people like that that are yeah. just mean-spirited and that, and then you don't hear about them anymore. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, the mean, you know, the mean ones, they, they kind of pushed their way in there. But I think uh, the tur tortoise and the hare, you know, I'm a big tortoise guy. Right. I think the tortoise... Just building your brand and having a huge foundation. My, my team was just in Vegas at the licensing show. And what they realized is people used to try to invent brands, you know, like facades. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a real brand. This How is would you a brand that's it? built on, on actually accomplishing important things in the world. Yeah. Um, Disney has accomplished great things in the world. But everybody thinks that, well, you know, I can do a mouse and some uh, imitations don't work. Yeah. Be original first. It's a real substance to yeah, it. Yeah, right? get some substance to it, live it, you know, dream it, and then share it. But um, my foundation and, and my brand is built on accomplishing super high goals uh, in the areas of, of the environment, protecting the environment. Well, yeah, what's interesting is, is, is your, your belief in sustaining things, and even in your bathroom here, which I think is kind of funny, there's a little sign that says, keep it nicer than it was before you showed up. And that's kind of your philosophy, where you, you, you yeah. want things to be left in a better place than they were before you showed up. You know, the ocean, everything. Well, you know, and I, nobody's perfect either, but you don't have to be perfect. All you have to do is do a little better. Okay, so if everybody does a little better, and, and what's ironic is uh, if everybody does a little bit, you make a world of difference. You know, in the, in, the, in the last century, it was all about, like Jacques Cousteau, he, he went out himself and did things. Now it's about partnerships. Uh, so we're partnered with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. They do the greatest science, you know, on oceans and water, and then we bring the art. So w when two groups come together in that mastermind theory, you can accomplish big things. When a lot of groups and individuals come to, together, you know, they can change the world. Absolutely. And I'm here to help change the world uh, just in my little part, my little art part that I know. And, you know, writers, uh, you know, people say, you know, do what you know. Um, I've always known the art thing. You know, it's instinctive to me. But the greatest reward that you can have is when you share it with somebody and they appreciate it. The little lights come on, especially in those young eyes and minds. It's a great thing. Out of all the books you've, you've written, is there anything you'd recommend where to start for anyone that wants more information about you? I mean, what's the... Yeah, I say go to Wyland.com, W-Y Land. Get it? Y Land. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go to Wyland.com. You can see all my books there. There's one called Hold Your Water, kind of an unusual title. And it gives you 67 things to do to keep the planet blue, the ocean blue. And in the back, you can total little things you can do. Uh, to protect the quality of water and by protecting water, by protecting the energy and shutting off the lights and the water when you're brushing your teeth, you're actually saving money too. So kids, you're doing your family a favor. You're, you're doing good things in this economy. If all the people, all the good people on the planet unite, we, we can have a, a, not only um, a great society, great kids, but we can have a clean, healthy ocean and environment and, and, and clean lakes, rivers, streams, ponds, wetlands. We have a beautiful, pristine environment. The health of the ocean and clean water is tied not only to fish, but to our health. Okay, that's a health issue that we need to get in front of. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. Plus, water has played the most important role of all in my life. I'm a water sign. You know, and when I'm immersed in water, I'm reborn. I feel I'm great. Aquarius, by the way, just so you oh, know. There you go. Okay. All right, all man. Right. So all the water signs out there. But water is so critical, and it's important to get in front of issues, not, oh, by the way, you know, we don't have any more water to drink. So uh, I believe the investment that I've made with my Wyland Foundation is the most important investment of all, and that's educating and inspiring kids to, to get involved today in issues that they strongly believe in. And art is the gateway to all that creativity and all that soul. Because if people see the beauty in nature, they'll work to preserve it. And art is a great way to uh, present that.
That's awesome. When you get discouraged, when you get overwhelmed, when anyone that's watching this it's like gets derailed, I mean, what recommendations would you have? Because you're, you, know, you have a lot of insight on a lot of things, uh, and you deal a lot with the creative mind. I mean, the mind can invent and, and, and develop so many enormous things, and it could also be a, a huge form of self-destruction for someone, too. And I've seen a lot of artists go off the deep end. Yeah. Um, what recommendations or, or things you could you share with, with people? On I this? always say uh, go back to your core. Go back to the things that, that give you joy. And go back there often. I mean, the thing that gives me joy, I'm a diver. I like being immersed in water. Okay? If I can't get in the ocean, I'm in my bathtub up there. I don't care. Right. There's something about water that reinvigorates your soul. And so, uh, you know, and then getting close to animals. You know, the native people would tell me, uh, if you're eye to eye with a bald eagle, that's the highest level of consciousness. Well, for me, being in the sea, swimming eye to eye with a humpback whale, I mean, it's unbelievable. Why they, whales? Why whales? Well, the whale has been iconic to me ever since Cousteau, and then eventually as I started diving and I started getting close to whales on their terms, I realized that the whales don't have a voice, so maybe I could be the voice for, for great whales and, and other life animals. And I've expanded not only from whales to other aquatic animals, but freshwater habitats and now land animals, realizing that the forest, the land, the air, the sea, it's all connected. If we're going to protect the ocean, we need to protect it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, famous last words then. Famous last words. This is a good wildland one. <laughs> There's two types of people. There's anchors and motors. Lose the anchors, get with the motors. That's awesome. And let's get the job done. It's a race to save the planet. The motors are going to lead the way. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. You're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch them.